Silver, April surge produced a peak weekly close below $29. But unlike gold, which then went lateral, silver surged again well above its surge high of April. And silver's pullback has since produced weekly closes that remain above that peak weekly close of April, unlike gold, which has gone horizontal. Welcome to the Morning Markets and Metals with Vince Lancey, where each day he brings you the precious metals and financial news to get you ready for your day. And now, here's Vince. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vince Lancey, and today's market rundown will take a look at Michael Oliver's mid-year assessment for gold and silver with some key levels going forward to watch for rally reignition. Uh, we'll also look at some market driving news. And let's get started with the prices right now. The dollar is 105.97, up 14. Ten-year yields are down one basis point, 445 after getting destroyed yesterday. Uh, the S&P 500 is down 24, 54.48. NASDAQ made a new all-time high again yesterday. The VIX is 1280, up 57. Gold is 23.23, down seven and a half bucks. Mixed overnight, that weakness started in the last, say, hour and a half or so. Silver, 29.32, down 11 cents, holding its own compared to gold. Copper, 4.43, up 44 basis points. Oil, again, strong, up 80 at $84.34, up 67 cents. Natural gas, 238, downside of unchanged. Bitcoin, 62,655, backing off after making a new high, recent high yesterday. Ethereum, 34.47, up nine. Grains are mixed. Wheat is down five. Soy is up 12, strongest. And corn is up two. That's the uh, August gold contract. Let's bring up spot for you here with all my lines. Now, I'm not showing it right now, but the 50-day moving average, that's a daily. Let's go to a daily. The 50-day moving average goes up like this and curls right around above. But right, in, it's basically a flat line, but it's starting to, to tail a little bit higher. Uh, why am I bringing that up? Because when you throw my lines in here, remember, this is the buyer, this is the buyer, this is the buyer the buyer, whoever the buyer is. And this is, this was a smaller buyer who got filled and might've actually been selling it, uh, reversing his position. And there was selling here. And so the selling went away and now we have nothing. Now this area is a dead zone. And now I'm looking for guidance as to what reignites us higher. And my, my, my reignition level is above this wick tentatively, but now there's this, moving average right here as well. And the 50 day moving average, if if the market crosses it and it slopes upward, you would expect macro discretionary money to come in and buy. Now we are on a holiday week. So if they do buy, they're not American. That's how you want to look at that. If we don't get above this area or get above this area and reject it, sustain above this area, I would fully expect this to go back to 2297 and test that, test the uh, the commitment of the buyers here on the way to the buyers here. Okay, uh, let's get to the topic du jour. Michael Oliver's mid-year gold and silver report card. Uh, every weekend he puts out a report, well, the, the weekly 360 degree or the weekly 360, and he touches on uh, multiple markets the major markets that matter, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, bonds in the form of TLT, gold and silver, as well as various currency markets if they're on his radar. Like yesterday, he put out something on the yen, uh, which I'm looking at. Uh, the dollar as well is covered on a regular basis. This weekend's was kind of a mid-year report card. And while he had updates for levels and various commodities, he also had a little bit of a, a little bit of a narrative uh, this is where we are year to date. So I'm calling I'm calling it a report card. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna cover a little bit of that. Here's our front page. Yesterday was a new uranium bull market post. Uh, 
coverage of the BCA report, which we thought was particularly interesting in the fact that it covered geopolitical, it covered uranium more globally than the banks have been recently. Uh, Harton at the inflation blame game. And it looks like we've got a lot of a lot of podcasts here. I guess writing is really hard for me to do and speaking is not. Well, anyway, you're stuck with me for now. All right, so here we go. MSA, that's Michael's firm, mid-year recap. Year to date, silver's up 21.4%. Gold is up 12.9%. Gold, February's low was to some extent a washout low before gold and silver's long-term momentum factors, 36-month momentum, 100-week momentum, et cetera, engaged. Look at how events unfold. And now I'm going to use my chart for now. Uh, the February low in here. Okay. And then now you have this market doing that. In early April, gold produced highs above 2,400 and a peak weekly close also credibly above 2,400. It matched that close in May as well. But since its first pullback from that April surge high, it has gone lateral, ho-hum, boring. And frankly, ho-hum is a statement. Unlike surge highs of the past three years, this one did not spike and collapse only to labor well below the spike high. Instead, gold has picked its teeth only, a pause we argue. Adding to that, he's saying something that he said a couple of days ago and something we've been saying for, from a different perspective at all, uh, completely for the last uh, several months. And that when the market made when the gold market made a high on December third uh, and was slammed down by the Bank of International Settlements, I can't prove it, but you can't prove me wrong. I'm right. Um, the market should have, arguably, pursuant to what he just said, uh, gotten destroyed, and it didn't. It stayed in a two month, almost three month, sideways range before being reignited in March and then re reignited in April, as he notes. Um, to go above 2400 and during that time frame as we've noted the open interest continues to continued to slough off as speculative longs got out of the market and yet the market did not sell off as he alludes to in the past the market makes a spike high it gets sat on for whatever reason by whoever it doesn't matter it could just be longs getting out and then the market loses faith very quickly and begins to sell off. This time, that's not happening. And that's not happening because, as we argue, there is buying uh, that is accumulating long-term, big numbers, central bank, sovereign wealth fund, and macro discretionary, all buying in the same area, central bank being the anchor that gets through it. And that's what happened then. He's very focused on, and I'm happy to hear this, the more recent behavior, which confirms which I'm sorry, not confirms. Which um, is a is a is a is a is a redo or is a it's a a replication of what happened in December through the end of February, and it also, from our point of view, uh, has the open interest decreasing. Now it's it's steeper actually, uh, so it's more interesting uh, and it makes us more more alert. So at this point in the game, knowing what we know and seeing how our thesis has been uh, proven correct so far, we look for actionable levels, and that's where we're looking at Michael's stuff uh, today. So uh, again, to, to reiterate what he said, unlike surge highs of the past three years, this one did not spike and collapse only to labor well below the spike high. Instead, gold has picked its teeth only, a pause we argue, and I would agree with him. Silver, not similar, but similar results. And its April surge produced a peak weekly close above below $29. But unlike gold, which then went lateral, silver surged again well above its surge high of April. And silver's pullback has since produced weekly closes that remain above that peak weekly close of April, unlike gold, which has gone horizontal. So if you were looking at them, Side by side chart wise, uh, March 1st, when gold took off, silver lagged and then took off. And then after April, okay, silver surged again. So gold flatlined starting in April, 
and silver surged again. So silver's actually, in momentum terms, looking at his analysis, silver's actually ahead of gold. Anyway, for those of you who claim silver is, again, quote, a dog, pause and look at the action so far this year. From its low in that February drop, gold has gained 22.8% as its top tick. However, since its February low, silver has gained 49%. Now, he's saying, he's giving you the explanation of what we've seen in, let me put it up here for a second, the gold-silver chart. No, I don't have it handy. But that that's what's going on, right? Right. So so when gold rallied, remember gold rallied, silver kind of rallied, right? Then they went sideways and you're like, okay, okay. And then gold stayed flat and silver resurged. And that, that trend line on the gold-silver ratio broke. For me, it's below. For him, it's above. And uh, it never retested. And, you know, it usually retests it. It usually the break doesn't last long. It's usually a good signal for an end of a move. Anyway, um, I'm going to give you a quick level check. This is by no means um, comprehensive, but this is uh, our compilation of his two most important levels. GCQ above 2357. That's the daily weekly close that we need. Uh could give us an extended target of 2,500, extended target, not the first target. GCQ, that's August gold. SIU, that's September silver, above $30.04 on our daily weekly close, gives a similar reignition for that. Now, on the following pages, uh, this is, again, we're back to his words. On the following pages, we update some more trading scale metrics that will indicate when the recent short-term pullback is ending. So what he's saying is we're in a pause both markets are in a pause. Uh, you would think we would have come off by now, editorially speaking, but we haven't. Uh, and uh, he gives some more, he gives those levels with a little bit more meat on them. Uh, and we're going to go through those again at bottom using his charts and kind of elaborating on he, how to read his stuff. Okay. Basically, he's a momentum person to confirm price. This is my impression. He uses momentum to confirm price action, which is similar to me, how I use volatility to confirm price action, but it's not entirely the same. All right. Uh, market news, AI advances and OG enforcement. Uh, most of the stories today in the finance side are about uh, AI advances. And by that, I mean, searching for electricity, like tech companies are searching for electricity. Uh, you could just, this is all going to, it's going to end up becoming higher prices of electricity for citizens. And that's why we need more nuclear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So go out and buy some uranium because of what I just said. That's the idea here. Northern Data is speaking with potential advisors about a U.S. IPO offering its initial public artificial intelligence cloud computing data. Center business could fetch a value, excuse me, of $16 billion. Okay. So, you know, there you go. The, the money is going into AI infrastructure and data centers, and everyone's talking about it now. But everyone we know is talking about it now. Not everyone. Everybody out there is still, like, you know, in the weeds. Boeing must either plead guilty to felony fraud or go to – this is the other trend. The other trend is, is AI is getting money spent on it, and existing industry is getting hammered by antitrust or uh, – felonious fraud or, you know, just basically the old industry is getting crucified while the new industry is being born. Happens all the time, but we're in the middle of it right now. So it's easy. It's particularly easy to see. NVIDIA is said to be charged by the French antitrust. Now, this is interesting because this is a new company getting attacked by an antitrust regulator. Now, when that happens, you know, that defies what I said, new company, new industry, old industry. That's trade war. That's your pushing back against American dominance. Okay. it's That's a negotiation. Much of China's new energy vehicle sales are being driven by hybrid powered vehicles rather than purely battery powered ones. That's the marketplace telling you EVs are not where it's at. They may be where it's at, but they're not where it's at right now. They're just not feasible economically. BlackRock Chief Executive Officer Larry Fink said its acquisition of data provider Prequin, I think it's how you say it, will allow the firm best known for its index funds to apply the format to fast-growing assets. Guys, they want to index everything. They want to index all assets. 
on the private sector as well. So we're going to create an index of anything. We're going to index anything that if there's enough of it trading, we can, or, or enough of it bought and sold in, in trade, uh, that we can create an index. And when you create an index, you create a standard. When you create a standard, you create a product. And when you create a product, you own the product. That's how it works, okay? If there's enough people interested in something, you create an index. And that's kind of like creating a, a, a price that you can broadcast. And if you create that price, you're creating a standard. And all industries will focus on the standard. And once you create the standard, you attract flows that say, hey, I want to put my money into the standard and an index is born. That's how the Dow Jones was born. That's how the S&P 500 was born. That's how the XAU was born. That's how indexes are born. So if everyone in the world wants Velcro, these guys are going to have enough data information with blockchain involved as well that they're going to be able to create a Velcro index. Everything is going to be securitized by these guys. So as equities get boring, they're going to securitize tea farmers in India and say, okay, who wants to get into the Indian tea farm exchange? It's really, it's really good in terms of transparency and seeing how things really are. I just don't like the people that are doing it. And that means it's too consolidated into too few hands. The Zeta Economic Index launched Monday uses generative AI to announce what its developers call trillions. Of See this? This AI index makes this possible. Okay, moving on. Geopolitics, nothing big to talk about today for a change. Thank goodness. Data on deck. Stay with us after this. We're going to go through more detail on uh, the uh, precious metals portion of the Michael Oliver report. All right, today is Tuesday, uh, Federal Reserve Chair speech in Portugal. There's also more ISM data today. Uh, yesterday's ISM data came out hotter than expected. Actually, that surprised me as well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons bonds crater, but stocks didn't care. Stocks are not moving because of uh, because of the economy. Stocks are moving because of uh, intervention. Let's put it this way. So, all right, so stay with us. The premium is going to start now, right after I do a quick check on the markets, and let's go to an hourly. That's a bad hour. Right, that's a bad hour, and it's happening at seven forty-eight. All right, hard to tell what to think of this today. Uh, okay, that's not good. All right, so how's this? Need your comment. If this cracks here, don't be a buyer of gold. Then that will crack there. Okay, oil. Oh, by the way. Coming back to gold, I'll show you what an algo looks like. This this is a sell-off for whatever reason. This is probably a data number that came out. Yeah, 10 a.m. I think that was when the data came out. And this is an algo covering short. This is the algo not buying anymore and more information coming out. For whatever reason, the market sells off. This could be an algo, probably not. And so you want to be aware that this market is being played on events from the short side. Event, sell it. Event, whatever the event is, sell it. Sell it. Okay, so you're getting these washouts and rallies. The difference between this market and the market two years ago is after this, you get what we call the uh, uh, the sideways and then collapse. But we're not. Whoever is selling and making money is saying, I don't want to be that short. And they're covering it. This is a new market, folks. Okay. Have a great day. Well, thanks for tuning in to today's Markets and Metals with Vince Lancey. The show is brought to you each day by Miles Franklin Precious Metals, who we encourage you to consider for your next gold or silver purchase or sale. Miles Franklin has pricing that's among the best in the industry on most products. And Arcadia is proud to be a licensed Miles Franklin representative and happy to help whenever you have questions or want to place an order. Where this week's silver special is Retail Preziosi Silver Kilo Bars for only $1.79 over spot. And certainly with premium still on the low side while well, the price is pulled back, if you're looking to add to your silver stack, 
The Etel Preziosi Kilo Bars are a great way to do so. And you can find out more by calling us at 833-326-4653 or emailing Arcadia at milesfranklin.com. And as always, thanks for watching. Please note that this video is not intended as legal licensed financial trading advice and is to be used for informational purposes only. Please contact your financial advisor before making any decisions. And thanks for watching.